Hi friends, my name is Host Eric, and I am the host of Talking with Fans People, and also author of Gospel of the Pantheon. It was a hundred thousand million years ago, things were really slow, nobody else yet to show, place the slabs below, and plant them so, the plan can start to go. More years into and tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view And last totally resolved from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them Welcome so back to Gospel the of the Pantheon We're gonna read verse three of I, What chapter? Nine? Chapter nine I believe? Verse 3. The ceremony took place on Saturday, less than one week from the day of Smythe's arrival. All the landed gentry of New Hamptonshire were present, as were many of those of York, for the journey from Smythe's small earldom to Hamptonshire City requires at most three days, even for a cumbersome caravan of a nobleman and the courier carrying news of the earl's looming wedding date had reached Yorktown by Wednesday morning. It's a long sentence. Indeed, it felt just like... Indeed, it felt like just about everyone from the area with a title before or after his or her name, no matter how minor, was in attendance at the cathedral that day. The Church of Squalor was overflowing with counts and viscounts, viceroys and bishops, squires and ladies, and the Duchess put on a celebration fitting to such an occasion. She was, after all, in a celebratory mood. Within two days, the Earl would be dead, and as his only legal heir, she would rule not only her own duchy, but the Earldom of York as well. So, she pulled out all the stops for this party, and as a consequence, much of the workforce of her estate was deployed on that Saturday in January of 1891 to the cathedral. Among these workers was Rigoberto Relegetti. Relegetti, now 30 years old, had been assigned the job of picking up the empty glasses and plates that the, gla that the guests set down in various spots around the cathedral, and of returning them to the kitchen area to be cleaned and refilled. In keeping with squalid doctrine, the ceremony began in the late morning and lasted the entire day. By the time the actual marrying part commenced in the evening, everyone in attendance, including all of the clergy, all of the guests, and all of the staff, was thoroughly loaded. This definitely includes Relegetti, for his particular job had enabled him to give the many half-finished drinks he carted towards the kitchen a good home in his belly. On one occasion in the late afternoon, a chamberlain from the estate had seen Relegetti doing this and challenged the groundskeeper about it. I'm ensuring none of the judges' liquor goes to waste, Rigoberto had proclaimed with an indignant slur. So you just leave me alone. Fortunately, the Chamberlain had been called away by some minor noble before Relegetti could get himself into any real trouble. Regardless, I'm sure you can guess what happened. A squalid wedding, you see, is much like a game of high stakes pin the tail on the donkey. And once all of the inane rituals, the spinning around, the fireworks, the plunging of the room into complete darkness for a full 20 minutes, and all of the other pointless rigmarole directed by squalid doctrines were completed, the bishop presided, presiding over the duchess's wedding declared the two people standing before him to be man and wife. The bishop, bishop then, the, uh, the bishop then, as is stipulated in squalid doctrine, removed the blindfolds of binding and bonding that covered the eyes of the bride and groom. Of course, the eyes of the priest in attendance and just about everybody else in the room were also covered, so the moment of deep blindfolding always held a few surprises. The Duchess, when the bishop removed her blindfold, said nothing at all. She simply looked at the swarthy groundskeeper with unkempt hair who stood directly before her and slowly shook her head. And when Rigoberto's blindfold was lifted, and when his eyes settled into some semblance of focus, Relegetti saw the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, standing right in front of him. Kimberly. Verse 4. Immediately following the wedding, the Duchess was, of course, livid. That is not to say, however, that she was particularly concerned. She begged the Earl for a few days to set things straight, <coughs> and she assured him that she would, quote, still be a virgin, unquote, when the matrimonial misfire had been rectified. But because Relegetti was now Duke, the Duchess could not pursue the simplest solution and order that the man be executed. There were a few rules that even the Duchess couldn't break. Opening, openly killing her people's rightful Duke was one of them. Even though the commoners knew nothing about and had no reason to feel anything in particular towards Relegetti, they loved their new Duke all the same. It was about the word before the name, not the, ma the man behind it. It was a totally irrational type of national pride, but that didn't make it any less important to those who felt it. But there were many 
other ways in which the Duchess might resolve her problem. The most obvious approach was probably the best, so she decided to implement upon Raoul Getty the same poisoning plot that she had planned for Smythe. The Duchess was confident that there would be plenty of poison left to do in Smythe after the next wedding, which she would hold the very next day after she saw to it that her first marriage ended in widowhood. And once both men were dead, she'd mount a vigorous investigation into it and catch and execute a couple of assassins. Maybe she'd even pen it on Elmingston. That way, just in case she ended up needing one, she'd have a motivated and bloodthirsty, pop bloodthirsty populace. The Duchess had spent the morning after the Relegetti wedding making the above calculations. Then, around noon, she sat upon her bed, propped upright with pillows stacked against the headboard, and prepared to eat the first bite of her lunch. <coughs> you must not kill him, Duchess. Startled by both the unexpected voice and the sudden appearance of being directly in front of her, the Duchess jerked in alarm, and her fork flew into the air. The bite of pork sausage that had been perked upon the fork's prongs now landed instead onto her nice white feather-down blanket. Kevin and Trump, please, cursed the woman. Why is it that you must drop in unannounced? I have a protocol for receiving visitors, you know. Look what you did to my blanket. Would it kill you to be announced like everybody else? I repeat, Duchess, said the god from the foot of her bed, you may not cause the death of Rigoberto Relighetti. If you do, you will incur not only my wrath, but the wrath of many of the other gods as well, and your reign in New Hamptonshire will come to a quick and certain end. What the hell are you talking about? What makes you think I'm going to kill the man? And why can't I kill him? demanded the Duchess. Because there are many gods who feel strongly that he must survive, and though killing him may serve your interests, I assure you that the interests of the rest of you mortals and us gods are best served by letting him live. The Duchess folded her arms and glared at the god. You know, you have a lot of gall, god. Do you think I have forgotten what you did to me last time you visited? Do you perhaps imagine that I have become philosophical about the awful desecration you inflicted upon me? It doesn't matter whether you have or not. Do you think I enjoyed being pregnant for seven years? I'm not here regarding any of those things, Duchess, so there's no point in discussing them, said the god flatly. Exactly my point! You came in here telling me how I ought to manage my affairs as though we can discuss whatever you wish despite there being unfinished business between us. But we cannot, God, because there is business, and it is yet unfinished. And no doubt, said the God, such business there will continue to be. That does not change what I am telling you today, woman, and I suggest that you attend to my words carefully and respect the explicit orders of the gods. Do not kill Relegetti! You ask that I respect your orders. You... The being who has disrespected my sovereignty, it seems, at every turn. I shall do no such thing, God, for you have not earned my respect. The only thing you have earned is a particularly slow and brutal castration. And I would die a happy woman if only I could be the one to administer it. Trapper Triplecles leveled a steady look at the mortal, but he said nothing. The Duchess, her arms still folded, <laughs> assessed the god's look, decided she could handle him and cut to the chase. I am going to kill the man, in Trapper Triplecles, and that's all there is to it. Yes, I despise you, but please understand that has nothing to do with this. For that matter, neither does Valagetti. He did nothing wrong, but to kill him nevertheless is precisely what I shall do. It's the clearest, simplest, and possibly the only solution to my problem, and my problem is one that must be solved. In Tropotropicles, who had been leaning towards the Duchess, his hands on his propped-up knee, now put both feet on the floor and raised himself up. He looked much larger and more imposing than the Duchess recalled him ever looking before. His face showed no expression, but he outstretched his arms and held them there for a goodly stretch. And when at last he spoke, his voice was a boom that carried the will of the full pantheon of gods behind it. Do not attempt to cross the gods regarding this matter, mortal. Let it here be said that should Rigoberto Relegetti die, Duchess, you will be held accountable no matter what your involvement in the death might be. His well-being is now your burden, woman. The Duchess was fully convinced. He had not known that Entropocles had such ferocity within him, but this display chilled her to the core. It was all that she could do to not get up and flee the room. 
Yet the god intoned on, still, and the woman knew real terror. And heed me, heed you me this, boomed the voice of Interrupted Hippocles. Carry your burden. With great care, mortal, for if relegate he dies, you shall know naught but despair from the moment of your failure until your final agonized breath. You have but one choice in the matter. You shall see to the continued well-being of this man, or you shall know the unimaginable fury of a pantheon of immortals. Each denied is due by your impudence. The Duchess whimpered. She could not help it. She noticed that she had buried her head in her pillow at some point during the speech. And it took her at least a full minute and several clear throat clearings to regain her voice. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Seriously, I, I hear you. She finally stammered. I, I... You can trust me. I won't touch a hair on his head. I promise. Okay? Just as quickly as the god's ire had become manifest, it was gone, and Interrupted Hippocles once again became the immortal that the Duchess had thought she had known. That's very reassuring to hear, Duchess, he said. And let me add that we gods really do appreciate your cooperation in this matter. But if the god could quickly shift gears, so too could the Duchess. Not quite as quickly, perhaps, but quickly nevertheless. It should be remembered that the Duchess was quite an old woman and very experienced, therefore. She knew that the terror she had felt was some manner of god magic, and with this knowledge she was able to shake off the fear much faster than any other mortal could have hoped to. Once she had gathered her wits, she hazarded another stab at protest, although this time a rather more deferential one. Nevertheless, you surely cannot expect me to remain married to my groundskeeper. What would you recommend I do about this mess, given that the most obvious solution is denied me? The immortal, however, had no interest in hanging around and answering questions, and he would not be doing any bargaining today. There may be other ways to dissolve your marriage, shrugged the god. I suggest you look into the matter if it's really so important to you. Can't hurt to try, but I wouldn't get your hopes up. And then the god in Tropicopolis was gone, and the duchess was left with nothing but the pork on her bed and the residual adrenaline in her veins to keep her company. Pork on her bed? Yeah, because when the god showed up, it caused startled her, and she threw her fork up in the air. And oh, no, you said pork. Yeah, well, on uh, on the tip of the fork was a piece of pork. Oh. And that concludes Chapter 9. I see her. She's so beautiful. Oh, my beautiful red. So it's good and true and just. It was a hundred thousand million years ago. Things were really slow. Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go More years into And tears gnashing through Oh holy slabs come into view And last holy result from two Into a regal history That demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go